Let's pray together. Father, for the joy of worshiping you together, we thank you. Lord, for the happy anticipation that Christ will meet us in word and sacrament this morning, we praise your name. Father, many times you have met with your people in this very room. We ask that you do so again. You know each one of us through and through. You know our past, you see our hearts, and you understand our future. So would you take this word and may each person here hear Christ speaking to them. Thank you that you're able to do this for Jesus' sake, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Please be seated, and I encourage you to open up in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 32. Now, the passage proper for today is 7 to 14, but I ask for the verses 1 to 6 to be read just to provide the context. And this passage is one of those disturbing passages that militant atheists such as Richard Dawkins, who, by the way, describes himself as a cultural Anglican, have a field day with. In his book, The God Delusion, Dawkins writes, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, capriciously malevolent bully. In addition to blasphemy, people like Dawkins are guilty of not reading their Bibles well. You see, when we read Exodus 32 in its context, we see that it's not the Lord, but it's the people who are capricious and fickle. These are the same people who, after entering into covenant with the Lord after redemption from Egypt, not once but twice declared all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And only six short weeks after enthusiastically and solemnly ratifying the covenant, they break several of the commandments. And the shift is startling. It's like committing adultery on your wedding night. We all know this familiar story. The people are gathered at the base of Sinai, and they've tired of waiting for Moses, who's been gone for 40 days. So they gang up against Aaron, and they demand, up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what's happened to him. These are the first recorded words of the people since their vows of allegiance in chapter 24. They've become impatient, perhaps even contemptuous, this Moses, and maybe even fear or panic has set in. You remember, Moses is their one mediator. They themselves had requested that he serve as a buffer between the Lord and themselves, and now they've lost their mediator. They obviously don't trust the Lord any longer either. Aaron, who should have known better, caves and directs the people to give him their gold, which was meant, by the way, for the tabernacle furnishings, and he crafts what is traditionally understood to be a calf, a molten calf. As the psalmist reflects in Psalm 106, they exchange the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. Now in verses 7 to 14, the passage for today, the narrative shifts to the summit of Mount Sinai, where Moses is unaware of the people's apostasy at the base of the mountain. Well, the Lord gives Moses the facts and commands Moses to descend the mountain and deal with the people. Go down for your people, well, that's pretty ominous, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. And then the Lord goes on to describe the people as turning aside quickly out of the way I commanded them and as stiff-necked. Stiff-necked. It's a farmer's metaphor of a horse that won't respond appropriately when a lead rope is tugged, but instead pulls the other way, or an ox that will not submit its neck to the yoke and instead draws back. We're to picture a person with their head held high in contempt, obstinate, self-willed, resolute in their own ways. You see, the stiff posture of the neck simply reflects a hard heart that refuses to yield to the Lord's will. 
Before Moses can respond, the Lord declares his judgment and tells Moses he's going to destroy the people and start over with Moses. Listen to verse 10. Therefore, let me alone, we're going to come back to that, that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. Do you see what's happening here? The Lord is threatening to wipe out his people and start over with Moses. And he uses the same language that he had used in Genesis 12 when he said to Abram, I will make you a great nation. What a flattering offer. I don't know about you, but I know my own heart. Would I have been tempted to say, Lord, you know what's best. Who am I to question your sovereign wisdom? Let's go. Now, let me alone. The Lord seems to leave a crack in the door open for intercession, and Moses seizes the opportunity. The Lord could have shut the door, as he will, when Moses again comes to to intercede at the end of the 40 years of wilderness wandering, this time on his own behalf, when he requests permission to enter the land of promise, after his sin in the desert. But listen to Moses' words in Deuteronomy 3. But the Lord was angry with me because of you and would not listen to me. And the Lord said to me, enough from you. Do not speak to me of this matter again. God reserves the right to answer prayer as he sees fit. Why does Moses ignore the Lord's command, leave me alone, as well as the offer to become the new Abraham. Well, why does he instead intercede on behalf of this people? Because he's more interested in his fellow Israelites' welfare and well-being than he is his own advancement and glory. Wow, Moses has come a long way. Remember back in Exodus 3 and 4 when the Lord reveals himself to Moses and tells him to go to Pharaoh, and that Moses will be the one to lead the people out of Egypt. Moses likes the idea of redemption, but then he gives excuse after excuse after excuse, and finally says, Lord, just get someone else. Okay? He's grown in compassion and become much more like the Lord. How does he pray? Well, without excusing the people in any way, he has this threefold argument And his three reasons are rooted not in what Moses thinks is best for the people, but on the basis of the Lord himself. First, he appeals to the Lord's reasonableness and reminds the Lord of his sovereign election and recent redemption of this people. Look at verse 11. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people? caught that gentle reminder, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Second, Moses appeals to the Lord's reputation. Look at verse 12. Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent did he bring them out, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. You see, one of the reasons that the Lord had redeemed his people from Egypt was so that others may know that Yahweh is Lord, that his glory and name might be honored among all the nations. Finally, Moses appeals to the Lord's covenant promises and the consistency of his own nature. Look at verse 13. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. The Lord had personally sworn to the patriarch. So this is a matter of the Lord being true to himself. His trustworthiness is at stake. Did you notice that Moses doesn't say, Lord, aren't you being a little hard on these people? Can you lighten up a bit? After all, I've been gone for six weeks. You know how it is when the cat's away, the mice will play. Or Lord, 
They've given so much to the Trinity Scholarship Fund this year. <laughs> At no point does Moses excuse the people for their sin or argue to mitigate their deserving of divine punishment. Rather, he appeals to the Lord's character, his reputation, his past actions, and his promises. It's all based on the Lord. And at the end of the passage, the narrator tells us that Moses' arguments were effective. Look at verse 14. And the Lord changed his mind. The Hebrew there is Nacham. The Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. The Lord changed his mind. What are we to do with this? Right? The standard thinking goes something like this. If we can get God to change plans and act in a way that he originally intended not to act, then how can he be sovereign or immutable? And the passage here presents the situation as involving a true give and take between Moses and the Lord. And yet the clear teaching in scripture, for example, Numbers 23, God is not a man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind, nacham, same Hebrew word. Again in 1 Samuel 15, and also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, nacham, for he is not a man that he should have regret. What do we do with this? Article 20 of the 39 Articles reminds us that we seek not to so expound one place of scripture that it be repugnant to another. We use scripture to interpret scripture, and we interpret less clear passages of scripture in light of texts that are clearer. And somehow these diverse portrayals of the Lord are enriching and not ultimately contradictory. Do we punt to open theism, which contends that God is learning as he goes and his foreknowledge is not absolute? No, because we can't read this narrative passage in light of in isolation from the rest of scripture, which clearly affirms the sovereignty and omniscience of the Lord. Some suggest that the Lord never really intended to destroy the Israelites and was just testing Moses. My only problem with that interpretation is it's not what the text says. God is not just acting here. This is not a false threat. Is this an example of scripture using phenomenological language? That is the illusion or appearance, things as they seem to us, not necessarily as they really are. You know, we talk about the sun setting and rising or the closely related thought of anthropomorphism that is using human terms to describe God? Certainly, there are examples throughout scripture of accommodating the truth to our ways of speech, conception, and our capacities so that we can grasp truth. But I think these proposed solutions are too weak to work here in Exodus 32. As far as we know, According to Exodus 32, the Lord's intention was to destroy Israel. Moses interceded. The Lord changed his mind and did something else. Scripture draws a distinction between divine statements of the Lord's intention of his promised blessings or threatened judgments and the Lord's eternal decrees. Regarding his eternal decrees, Scripture is clear that the Lord does not change his mind. His eternal purposes always stand. But of the former, his intentions to either bless or judge, the Lord may, Nacham, relent. In Jeremiah 18, the Lord reveals to Jeremiah this general policy. When threats of judgment are followed by repentance, think the Ninevites in the book of Jonah, he will relent and not judge. Conversely, if promises of blessing are met with presumption, he will reconsider the good that he had intended. Think the exile. 
In Genesis 18, we learn that due to Abraham's intercession, the Lord was willing to Naham regarding his intent to punish Sodom and Gomorrah if only 10 righteous people were found in the city. This picture of God relenting or changing his mind in regards to judging or blessing, when we understand it in light of the canon of scripture, does not contradict the truth of God's sovereignty or immutability, precisely because his relenting is the expression of a deeper unchangeability and constancy of his character. He's a God abounding in mercy, love, and grace. And his eternal purposes, which include ultimately fulfilling his covenant pledge to his people, always stand. And his eternal plan includes using our actions and prayers to accomplish his eternal decrees. Dear friends, it's precisely because God does not change in his eternal decrees that Israel is still around after Exodus 32. What Exodus 32 demonstrates to us is that the Lord doesn't always operate in a unilateral fashion. Prayer matters. Our prayer matters. We serve a God who listens to our prayers. He weighs what we say and often adjusts his intentions. To be sure, his mercy and grace are his to give or withhold, so we can't be presumptuous. But one point of Exodus 32 is to encourage us to pray. And neither Numbers 23 or 1 Samuel 15 oppose this paradigm of God's responsiveness to prayer. Immutability does not mean immobility or inactivity. We do not serve an eternally static God. Moses' pleading changed the situation. And what an encouragement, an enormous encouragement for us to pray. And what's more, even more encouraging is that we don't need to be able to explain all the mysteries of prayer before we pray. So I wonder, why aren't some of us as bold and gutsy as Moses in our prayers? Is there unbelief that God intervenes in history? Reread the lesson from 1 Timothy. The good news is that Christ has come to earth. There's an in, been an incarnation. He has died for sinners. When we come to the table later, may this reminder drive away any functional deism that's rattling around our brains. Are some of us struggling under the crushing weight of guilt or shame? Remember the psalm we read this morning, God forgives sinners. The table is for us, repentant sinners. Maybe some of us think, why pray if God's sovereign? He's going to do what he's going to do. We pray because we're commanded to pray. Prayer is one of the means ordained by God by which his will will be accomplished. As we all know, this is not the end of Moses' intercessory work. He's persistent and will pray on behalf of the people several times throughout the book of Exodus. In fact, later in this chapter, when he approaches the Lord about making atonement for the sin of the people. Remember, the tabernacle hasn't been built yet, nor has the Levitical sacrificial system been formally instituted. He offers that his own name be blotted out of the book of life in order that the people may live. But the Lord rejects Moses' offer, declaring that the guilty must pay for their own sins. Moses is insufficient for his own offer. As we've already noted, by the end of the 40 years of wilderness wanderings, he too will sin grievously and will himself need a perfect mediator. The guilty must pay for their own sins. This is the great mystery of the gospel. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5. For God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. You see, friends, same principle. 
different mediator. Our sin has been reckoned to Jesus. And this same glorified Jesus now always lives to intercede for his people. And we don't know how this heavenly dialogue between Jesus and the Father works, but we can trust based on the frequency and consistency with which Jesus encourages us to pray in the Gospels, that one of the things he's praying for us is that we grow as intercessors. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that in the mystery of your divine counsel, you use our prayers. Would you encourage us to pray more? Lord, we lift up this morning Richard Dawkins, Dennis Dennett, Sam Harris, Bart Ehrman, and these other mil militant atheists who don't know that the very breath they use to blaspheme you is a gift from your good hands. And we ask, Father, that as they seek to manipulate and pervert your word, that that word, which is sharper than any two-edged sword, would pierce through their souls and show them their need for a savior. We thank you that you're able to do this. So Father, please, we ask that you would encourage us this morning to pray, to want to pray because we care for other people. And thank you that Jesus is doing that very thing right now. He's praying for each one of us. And thank you that you hear our prayers for his sake. And so it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.